Welcome. I am Erin Schneider. I work with the North Central Fair Program, and I also farm in Wisconsin. I have a small CSA farm, but I am hosting today's uh, Farm, like Farming Matters feature and excited to be featuring Andrew Adamski. And Andrew, I know there's like a lot to, to unearth right in the, in the um, not just the title, but your project and what is happening on your farm. Um, so I will turn it over to you and give you a chance to, to share, share your story and share what, what is going on with your farmer ranch your grant research. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Adamski. I operate and own Full Circle Community Farm here in Green Bay, Wisconsin on traditional Menominee land. And we run a 300 member CSA, uh, our president of the Slow Farmers Cooperative. And we also operate uh, 300 acres of certified organic pasture where we graze grass fed beef, pasture pigs, and about 2000 laying hen pasture laying hens, along with 20 acres of vegetables, which is what we're here to talk about today. Thanks for yeah, being here. Thank Thanks for having me on here, Aaron. I'm really excited to get the information out there to all the folks that are interested in preserving their soil and doing some alternative advanced soil preparation techniques on their diversified organic vegetable farms. So that was kind of where I, we were coming from with our project was a lot of the preparations out there for organic vegetables are either you know, plow and rototill. There's some cover cropping starting to come in, um, but it's either super large scale or small scale, like Jam Forte, uh, Elliot Coleman, scales like that. And we were looking at a lot of the equipment and systems that they were using, those being power harrows, broad forks, you know, deep mulch compost systems. And we wanted to emulate that, but we have the acreage here in Wisconsin on my family's farm to do a little bit larger scale. So obviously Jam and that whole cohort, um, they, they have a system that works really well and trying to emulate that and scale it to different sizes and different styles of farming is I think the next logical step in the progression and advancement for market farming. So I always start my presentations and anything that I'm talking about with the land acknowledgement. So it's important to acknowledge who was here first, who was here before and honor the wisdom and knowledge that they still have with their traditions. Yeah, so a little bit about our farm. We're not just vegetables, we do pigs, and grass-fed beef and laying hens. Um, we're transitioning into perennializing the farm. So we have currants and hazelnuts and chestnuts, apples, plums, peaches. Uh, working on just doing a lot of different things. Share the crew. So we all know what no-till is. It's disturbing the soil as little as possible. A lot of different ways in here. You can see two different systems that have worked. Um, large and small scales. There's a picture of Jam. Really great person, idol to look up to. Um, and yeah, you can see here's the problem. Um, the existing no-till methods are broad fork at small scale, and you need a small army of people if you're gonna broad fork 12 acres of vegetables every year. Um, another issue could be that if it gets too large scale. You know, if you're up to 20 plus acres, it's pretty specialized equipment that you need like front hitch mounted roller crimpers amongst many a plethora of other things. Um, so yeah, looking at some of the equipment that we did, uh, we were specifically comparing rotovators to power harrows. So this is the main um, final soil preparation. Uh, rotovator is just a really fast spinning rototiller usually tractor mounted. So we did have one from doing pasture renovations for about 15 years that my dad still has. And then the power hero on the right here, this is the Ibex um, TS90, I believe, is the model that we purchased. Um, so you can see the main difference is the way the tines work. The rotovator, rototiller spins and turns like this. The power hero 
stirs in a vertical tillage. And the deepest it'll go is like three or four inches. It doesn't go very deep at all. Um, here's a video showing that action. It's kind of cool. I got slow motion. We'll see if it works. Oh, it's loud. But yeah, you can see how those tines just kind of spin around and they're not super deep into the soil, but we're trying to get just that surface layer of the soil open and available for seeding so that those seeds can get established. Um, we do have some problems. Oops. It, it's a loud machine. Um, it is PTO driven, so it's not like you know riding on horses and hearing the soft slush of soil falling against steel. Um, our biggest problems are it wears a lot of shear bolts out. Um, there's rocks that get stuck in there. We're in glacial till, so things get stuck, break. But luckily, they anticipated that, and there's a piece that, like I said, the shear bolt just comes off all the time. We replace that, um, and it can still be fairly aggressive in the soil. It will pulverize if it's too dry. Um, if the soil hasn't been loosened enough, it won't always break down the, this, the root ball zone enough. So for transplanting, sometimes things don't get planted deep enough. Um, but those are really the only two downfalls. I mean, it's a little more available during, if it's really wet, or not really wet, but if it's more wet, you can use it at a higher soil moisture than a rototiller because it's not going to smear as much, especially in our clay soil. Yeah. The deep shank ripper is, you were asking about the power harrow or the broad fork. Um, the deep shank ripper is what we decided to utilize. It's basically just goes 18 inches below the soil surface and breaks up any plow pan. This was our first iteration of it. Um, there, it's it's not a terribly complicated machine. I'm gonna mute the thing so I can talk while it's going. Um, it's just a piece of steel on a three point hitch, and you can see with this one, it's it, it like leans back. It doesn't always get into the soil all the way, so we started adding weights to it, um, and I welded a tooth onto the end so that it would grip and sort of lift that compacted sub layer a little bit. It still did a pretty good job, but only in the middle. So um, our beds are 36 inches on top and five feet center to center. So we don't have a huge planting zone, but more than enough to get in. But just ripping down the middle um, obviously leads to just the middle being uncompacted and the outer edges still having a little bit of compaction. Um, so it's not as complete over the entire bed as a broad fork would be. But um, our new iteration of it, we took a old single bottom uh, middle buster plow and took the plow part off of it. So it's just a shank going straight down into the soil wow. with a couple of weeds and it works pretty well. Do you think this might work well for like, for example, like some of your perennial bed prep when you're trying to so maybe, maybe where the one thing down the road would help for, for spacing or? I mean. Yeah, so that's something that, I mean, it's similar to a yeoman plow. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that the permaculture folks will use a lot where they'll use it to open up the root zone and then come in and mulch with landscape fabric or till or plow or whatever they're doing. Um, but yeah, this would work pretty well that way. Um, I've done it before to plant our currants. Mm -hmm. I'll deep shank right into the sod after, after flail mowing, um, deep shank and then power harrow. And then we can plant right into that. It works really, really well. Um, yeah, so the results we've gotten so far pretty decent. 
you know, we've had, we've been able to grow vegetables in these plots. Um, our preliminary data after one year, so we did have an issue with COVID where every, just about every single power hero that's sold in the United States is made in Italy. <laughs> so I was ordering it in 2020, spring 2020, which Italy got hit hardest. It's been a huge blur since then, but yeah, Italy was hit really hard at that point. They shut all the factories and distribution out. And so we were behind on the project for like the first six months. So we really only had one year under it when I did the first soil tests and there wasn't any significant difference at that point, but um, we're in year two and I'm seeing some anecdotal evidence that it seems to be causing a difference. But like I said, I still have to collect the data this fall. So we're testing soil uh, compaction, seeing how much it's compacted, uh, organic matter in the surface layer. So we're seeing how much uh, the inversion factor of the rotavator is degrading our organic matter and oxidizing it. And we're also looking at water infiltration rate. So seeing how fast water is able to percolate through into the bo bottom layers of soil, which is a great indicator of overall soil structure and health. So we picked three easy-ish easy tests to do because um, it's a mechanical operation that we're testing. So mm -hmm. the mechanics and physics of the soil are what's probably going to be affected first. Yeah. Are those your carrots this year or is that from last year? Or That's like, from last year. Last year, they look great. I mean, especially the- They did look great. Yeah, we yeah. got pretty good <laughs> yield out of them. They were all super straight. They were boleros. Oh, so they yeah. were like our storage carrots that were like a foot long, mm -hmm. a couple inches thick. So yeah, really good carrots. Um, the lettuces did really well. This year we did spinach in the spring. And then I cover cropped, I just did a quick little oat pea radish mix, mm -hmm. um, mowed that down and then I planted beets for the fall and they're looking pretty good. So yeah, this was, like I said, my presentation from Moses, mm -hmm. um, some, just some of the other equipment that we're using are got this old John Deere manure spreader, which fits perfectly over the beds and we can use to apply our compost. So, yeah, it's just ground drive. Um, it doesn't have a PTO, which, you know, depending on who you ask is great or bad. So, <laughs> but it allows us to put a lot of compost down. Um, we make it all on the farm from the cow manure bed pack and chicken bed pack from winter. This was a year or two, this was two years ago. So you can see we're still tilling the ground because it used to be pasture for 30 years. So there's still a lot to get out of there, but we're starting to get to see it as full on established garden beds that we can really be intentionally no-till with. Um, and then the last piece is the play I'm over here, just chopping up all the debris that's one issue with the power harrow is it doesn't incorporate any of the surface debris into, into the soil. So you get a lot laying on the surface, um, especially if you don't get a good chopping action from the flail mower, it doesn't incorporate very well. And then our cedar gets stuck. Um, it'll wash things off. It'll make it hard to cultivate all different types of things. So. Andrew, I'm I'm curious too. As part of you know your your project, I know you 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 shared this with the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Farming Conference, and then it also looks like you hosted a like a field day or farm dinner this um this summer as well. What were some yeah. of the things that um, farmers had questions about, or or that you would recommend to like from your project so far in terms of like you know, <laughs> here's what, I mean, you, you shared a lot of what you learned, but like, I mean, just in fielding those questions in the, um, from outreach um, this summer. 
Yeah, so a lot of the questions that farmers that I've talked to have is basically, is the power harrow worth it? Like, is it even worth investing in a whole new piece of equipment when the rototiller has been working just fine for me? Um, and what I basically tell people is, you know, if it works, it works. If you're just starting and you're choosing between a power harrow and a rotivator or a rototiller, I would say go for a power arrow, you know? It does basically the same thing and there's not any different equipment that you need beyond it that you're gonna use anyway. Um, and the farther you get, the less equipment you need. You know, eventually we're just gonna do flail mow, deep shank, compost, power arrow. So if you're designing your system from the start, it's definitely a good thing to do. If you are more established and you've been using a rototiller and you're looking to change, it's definitely something to try. Um, as they always say, never just go full in on a whole new thing right off the bat, you know? So if you're considering making the switch to a power harrow, um, cause yeah, there are definite soil benefits. So do you feel like um, this practice you'll continue with um, once once the you know your grant project is set to wrap up later? Yeah, I mean, I've been seeing a few other farms that are doing great examples of Flailmo deep shank power harrow in different combinations. Um, and I've seen the efficacy of it. We haven't used the rotivator at all this year. We did it a little bit last year. Um, I mean, the rotivator I used in our project, but nowhere else on the farm. Um, resetting some beds, we did use field cultivator, um, but I think definitely it's something that I could see us really standardizing and making just our standard system. And I don't see any need to go back to rototiller or rotivator. Power hero is working just fine. And there's a few more things that we can make even a little bit better, like the roller on the back, we just got the crumbler bar. But if I put some of the, um, the diamond pattern steel on it, I can't, I don't know what it's called. But the standard like seed bed roller you see on the back of those things, um, make it a little flat, a, a little more flat on the bed top, something like that. Um, yeah, just tweaking it little bits here and there. I, I don't see changing our system anytime soon. Yeah, Andrew, how do you, I mean, you also have a lot of like, you mentioned animals and you know, you house sitting for a neighbor's pig right now too, but like you have a lot of pasture and like beef and hogs on your farm too. How does that work with your vegetables or complement your um your CSA? Your farm? Well, the reason we're doing animals is not just for an income source. All of our compost, all of our fertility comes from the animals. So we collect all their poop, compost it, and put it back onto the soil. Mm -hmm. Cool. Your farm's been in your family for like over a hundred years and kind of that's been transitioning to a co-op farm model like that I also feel is an interesting thread to your to your like you know farm your farm operation as well as just how you how you farm all you do so yeah yeah the whole cooperative thing it's really looking back at the way grandpa and my great grandpa and his grandpa farmed Mm -hmm. Like, it was never just them by themselves. They were all doing it with the community. My grandpa was the president of the cooperative cheese plant right down the road. And so was my great grandpa. So co-ops have been deeply ingrained in my family for a long time. Mm -hmm. And co-op is just a, another way of community that involves operating a business together. Mm -hmm. So... The main reason we want to do it as a cooperative farm is that, you know, land ownership is a, can be a violent and challenging system to overcome. Um, 
if you have issues of who has access to land, you obviously get into a lot of deeply ingrained hierarchical, patriarchal issues in our societal systems that need to be addressed and seems to be collective and cooperative ownership of the resources is the best way to start to deconstruct that. I don't know how to just say so long for now, Andrew, but <laughs> I always ask, like, is there anything that's going to give you heartburn or make your heart sing that you that feels unsaid that you want to share with um, with our Farming Matters audience? Okay. I mean, I just want to give a huge thank you to Sarah. The whole project is really one of the best ways to encourage farmers to explore their own solutions. And without Sarah, we couldn't have done what we're doing. And a lot of other farms I know wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. <laughs>